Welcome to the Seminary and Combos podcast. In this podcast, we discuss what we've learned on our theological journey. And our theological journey has not been on pause, but we have taken a pause from classes for the moment. Our semester finished up the first part of May, and Eric has now officially finished his MDiv. Your diploma is on the wall, degree, excuse me, is on the wall in your office. And this semester, and really since then, I feel like we've had some great discussions because we had two classes that sort of tied into together. I was taking hermeneutics, and you were taking advanced expository preaching. So I know one thing that was brought up a lot with that class was text-driven preaching. What is that? So maybe you can define that. That's a good question. Um, In order to do that, first let's talk about expository preaching. Uh, Text-driven preaching is a refinement of expository preaching. Expository preaching is a really big umbrella, okay? Mm. There's not one specific exact definition for uh, expository preaching. Like as long as you're getting uh, your your content from your sermon, as long as that is being pulled from the text, basically that's expository. It's not meant. It, it it means that you're not reading into the text. You're not thinking of an idea. Ooh, this is a good idea. I want to preach on this. Let me find a Bible verse on it. And you're not using the Bible to support your own thoughts. Instead. You're pulling uh, ideas, concepts, truths right from the Bible, and you're preaching it because you're pulling it from the Bible. Now, that's very broad definition, Mm -hmm. but expository preaching, uh, David Allen says in in a lecture I actually found on YouTube, really good one. We'll link it at the end. But he says, uh, you know, everybody says, I'm an expository preacher. I'm an expository preacher. But you listen to the sermons, you're like, that's not expository. (laughs) So there's a lot of confusion even regarding the term expository preaching, which is why so many have refined it and now uh, use use a more specific term called text-driven preaching. Hmm. I would say, too, before we get into the definition of that, I for sure was guilty of exactly what you were talking about there. That's all I knew how to do as far as teaching ladies writing a lesson was I would come up with a concept or maybe I knew where in the Bible um, there was a specific passage that had been on my heart and mind, but I only knew how to go through and then just pull a bunch of scriptures and kind of try it to tie it into that and not think about the context or anything like that of that particular passage. It was just what do I want to convey? What is the message I want to get across in this rather than uh, what does the scripture need to say? Now, maybe that's a big difference there for women teaching versus preaching. I don't know, but I think you always have to be careful whether you're a lady teaching ladies or whether you're a pastor. Anytime you're handling the scripture and teaching people, it's a serious matter and yeah, you need to handle it right. Was given to the whole church, not just the males of the church. Yeah, yeah. So expository preaching is not a bad term. It's a great, it's a great, I mean, the class was called advanced expository preaching, Mm -hmm. but it it almost begs the question, oh, you're an expository preacher? Okay, how expository? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's such a broad term right now. Uh, Ever since Haddon Robinson really popularized it, it, it's so broad that uh, it's very common for preachers to get their main point from their their text, mm-hmm. but then the subpoints come from you know say if they're preaching from the book of Romans, their main point and the main theme of the text may be from their passage in Romans, and it mm-hmm. should be all right, and that's good, that's expository, right? But the problem is their subpoint is subpoint one is from Isaiah thirty four, mm-hmm. uh, their subpoint two is from Exodus. Uh, they have three different points in three different proverbs. Mm. And it's like, even though their main truth was from that text, the the sermon is overly systematic. In other words, Mm. okay, so there's a balance. Scripture has a human author Mm -hmm. and a divine author, Mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Both of those two authors have uh, speak. They have authorial intents. Mm -hmm. So the human author, Paul, when he wrote to the book, he wrote to the church at Rome, he had a specific reason for writing. So he picked up his pen and, and we must first get to this, get to the truth of what does this mean? 
what did Paul mean when he wrote this? And then it's only after we discover that, then we can have more of a systematic type of view and say, hey, if this sermon deals with this topic, all right, great. Where else does the Bible speak to that topic? Mm -hmm. And that's a good question. But the problem is, I think that there's a lot of people, myself included, mm -hmm have rushed to that second question of where else does the Bible speak mm. too soon? And in doing so, we effectively leave the text and mm. we leave the greatest authority for our, our sermon. And even though the main point is still from that text, so it's still classified as, quote, expository. But you're making a patchwork quilt of scriptures that's kind of your own creation. Correct, but the overall pattern is the pattern of the truth. So right. is that still expository? Well, yes. Is it the best kind of expository? I personally, um, I mean, that's not what text-driven preach. Text-driven preaching, on the other hand, is a refinement of that. So text-driven preaching uh, picks a passage of Scripture and it simply works through that passage, line upon line, word for word. So I don't preach on, uh, I mean, I've preached a whole sermons on one words before. <laughs> That's when you know you're overly systematic right there, where you preach a sermon on one word. Just and go then, get your strong skin cord. Exactly. And pick and a few out. <laughs> yes, yeah. And you go all over. Well, one test for me before I ever preach a message uh, I'm preaching through First Thessalonians right now. Mm -hmm. I try to ask myself if if the right the human writer was in this room. So if I'm preaching that message from First Thessalonians or from wherever, if Paul was in that room because he wrote it, would he come up to me afterwards and say, "That's exactly what I was thinking when I wrote that. That's mm -hmm. exactly what I meant. That's my goal." Because mm -hmm. uh, obviously, in doing so, I'm also uh, obeying and, and submitting to the divine inspiration of yeah. it because God chose to use Paul in that situation. Holy he men of saw God that, spake as they were moved. <laughs> yes, as they were moved yeah. or carried about or carried along by the Holy Ghost. So God chose to use the human writer and their situation in, in their context in order to write that passage. And mm -hmm. uh, taking heed to that is taking heed to God. That was something very eye-opening in hermeneutics. I had to write eight small papers, and it was on various types of biblical genres, from prophecy to epistles, proverbs, and one. the first section that we had to write on every single one of those papers was the context. What is the context? Who wrote this? What do we know about where they were writing from? To whom were they writing? The original um, recipients of, the, of that work. And so it's all, it's interesting to, to think about uh, the book, Women and the Word. Jen Wilkin kind of first introduced me to that whole idea as I was reading through that uh, before the spring semester. And it was just very, very good and has changed the way that I think and read the Bible. When I'm reading a passage, I'm trying to think about, okay, who was the original audience that would have heard this? Because it makes a difference in how you understand that scripture, and it gives a much more richer, fuller meaning to that scripture rather than you just reading it and saying, well, in my context today, what does this mean to me? Well, the scripture is not all about me. God had a reason for what he wrote, and he had the time periods in which he had those biblical authors write for a reason. I mean, he could still be giving inspiration to people and the Bible could not be finished in this day and time, but that's not how it worked. <laughs> and so there was a specific time and a place that he wanted those things recorded. Yeah, I've heard uh, instructors say this before, that when you read a text, there's two different questions you can ask yourself. What can I say about this? Or what does it say? Mm, yeah. And if, if, it's, if you're overly systematic, if you're thinking, what can I say about this? Or, you know, let me use other, other scriptures to show you my own systematic theology based upon this. We have to be careful that in doing so, and now cross-referencing is not bad. We're not, I'm not bashing cross-referencing, okay? <laughs> right. But if you overly cross-reference, you actually leave, you depart the context of the scripture, and that is extremely dangerous. Yeah, and when you're talking about the sufficiency of scripture, the text-driven preaching, that idea is to, to leave that text and to patchwork things together kind of almost gives the impression that that one specific text on its own is not sufficient. Yeah, 
And there's nothing wrong with, you know, teaching on certain topics and doing that from time to time mm -hmm. to, to learn about a different topic. There's nothing wrong with that. But the question that must be asked is, what's driving the content, okay? And this is what's so good about text-driven preaching is, what is the driving force behind what you preach and how you preach it? Mm. And even when you preach it, mm -hmm. do, do, do you personally decide, hmm, this is where I want to go. This is where I think. Well, the question with that is, who's the authority? And text, this is what's so great about text-driven preaching. Text-driven preaching rests on the foundation of the sufficiency of the scriptures. So the question that every preacher or teacher needs to ask is, is the scripture sufficient to accomplish God's work in the local church? If so, we should be able to just preach right through, right through books. Uh, we should be able to treat it line upon line, and it will uh, accomplish its purpose. I mean, the New Testament church was built upon the preaching of the Old Testament prophets. Look at Peter when he preached Pentecost from a kind of a relatively obscure passage in mm -hmm. Joel, mm -hmm. and look what happened. Whoa, uh, the church blew up. And yeah. it was built upon the preaching of the Old Testament. So, I mean, for us pastors, I feel like there has been a uh, so much sensationalism that has been taken place in the past hundred years, really ever since, well, Charles Finney and then J. Frank Norris, for sure, in our yeah. circles where we <laughs> came from. Um, and other people like Hiles, who, 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 you know, these names were very influential. Mm -hmm. And they, they were built off of sensational preaching that is... You, every message has to have a shocking truth and mm -hmm. you have to shock them. It, it's very emotionally charged type stuff. And so what this does is it puts a tremendous amount of uh, pressure on the preacher and they feel like they have to perform. Every single message has mm -hmm. to be this new shockwave and emotional. It's your ideas. It's giving yeah. inspirational speeches, really. And the question is, what if you're preaching through a passage and the text is a very simple text with a simple truth that's not shocking? The question is, is that text enough to mm -hmm. accomplish God's will in the church. Yeah. It goes back to faith in God's word, where he talks about his word not returning void, and it'll accomplish the things that he will. I forget how that how that verse goes. I feel like I'm not quoting it correctly, but the general idea is that it will accomplish what he wants it to accomplish. So let me ask you here, when you went to preach in class, so this was interesting watching you as your wife, because I remember you were pretty, you were a little bit nervous. And I was like, man, you've preached. You were a youth pastor for three years. You were a pastor for three and a half years. You've preached and taught a lot. And why is it that now going in, in the preaching class is a little bit, you took it very, very seriously. Not that you were like nervous to preach in front of people because you weren't, but how talk, talk about that. Well, to me, the preaching classes were one of the main reasons why I went back to seminary. Um, it, I mean, if I, if I got nothing else, I wanted to get that. <laughs> yeah. And I really liked the theology of preaching that was, that was taught there, the text-driven preaching. Um, so basically what our instructor demanded of us, well, I don't want to say demanded, in a good way, I mean, but what, what he expected, he says, all right, listen, uh, when you come up to preach, um, now he chose the text for us all. By the way, we didn't choose our own. He he assigned it the first day of class. You're going to have this text. You're going to have this. And they were all passages. It was not one verse, okay? Um, so like mine was, I think it was uh, 1 John 2, 1 through 5, I think. It was something, or 1 John 1, 1 through 5. It was, they, they call it a pericope, you know, a, a passage. Mm -hmm. But it's several verses. Typically, it, it's a unit of thought, uh, a paragraph. If you have a paragraph Bible, that really helps to identify these. But he would pick them because he knows these texts inside and out. Mm -hmm. Um I mean, this guy was a pastor for 40-some years in a mega church. He did all of his exegesis in the original language, in the Greek. So he expected that of us because you have to take Greek before you take expository preaching. So what he did was he expected us to walk through the passage talking and emphasizing about, you know, every single word and every clause. So when you look at your Bible, there's a lot of commas that those are, you know, in every clause, uh, every, you know, pa every group of words. He wanted us to comment on every single one. 
that's walking through the text. So, and this is where it's so great because it goes back to uh, verbal plenary inspiration. If you believe every word is important, then you must preach every single word. Mm -hmm. It's there for a reason. And this is where we're talking about people say, you know, I'm an expository preacher. Well, if they read their text and they only deal with two words in it, or if they only deal, they, they say they read Phrase. five. Yeah, yeah. They, they only, you know, they read five verses, but their whole text, where their whole sermon was over one phrase in the second verse. That's not text driven. That concept may be pulled from the scripture, but you are ripping that concept out from its context mm -hmm. when you do that. So basically he said, I want you to walk through simply when you preach, I want you to walk through your passage. Um, and I'm going to be in the back of the cl classroom with my Greek New Testament. And he's following along in his Greek New Testament. And if we miss something, we get docked for it. We got docked for it. So he wanted everything talked about. He wanted it because it, it, what happens is we can be so overemphasized the main point of it where all the rest fades out and it becomes blurry. Well, the question is this, is everything else in that text inspired also? It's just as inspired. It's just as sufficient. So it, it helps to keep it in context. And what, the other two pointers he gave us was, he said, when you go through it, you want to ask yourself a couple of questions. You want to spend time not on you what you want to spend time on necessarily. You, oh, I like this part. Great. You might like it, but you need to ask yourself these questions. The first question is, what concepts are talked about in the Bible in that passage that are foreign to us today? Hmm. For example, mine had the word joy in it. Mm -hmm. All right. And I had to park there because our, uh, you know, in, in this time in America, we falsely associate joy with luxury. Hmm. We, that, that's not the kind of joy that was talked about in the Bible. So, so there's a big disconnect there. And he said that you don't just emphasize what you want to emphasize. You need to park on the places where there's a big disconnect on. All right. Mm -hmm. If there's a cultural concept that we don't understand, you need to park there and talk about that. Yeah. And then he said, so that, that's one area that, that he said, when, as you walk through it, park in those areas. And the other areas is you are also the, uh, the pastor. Um, so you're pastoring as you preach. If there is a specific part of that that you feel needs emphasized, he says you have the right to emphasize it so long as you don't overemphasize it to mutilate the scriptures. Hmm. That's good. So he's, he, he, you know, you can pastor as you preach. You can do some pastoral pastor as you preach and as you walk through. Um, but don't overemphasize something small to the, well, I just think they need it. Well, obviously God doesn't think they need it right now because that's not what's emphasized in the text. Yeah. And that's what it comes down to. What's driving the sermon? And that's why every single time when you wrestle with this theology of preaching, you're going to come back to that question, is the scripture sufficient? Mm -hmm. And you have to wrestle with it and, and, and leave your sermon thinking and, and believing and, and knowing that if you preached that text, then you accomplished God's purpose because mm -hmm. he's already given us all the ammo in the, in the scripture. Yeah. That's all good stuff. I feel like that applies to anybody to a certain extent. Obviously, I'm not a preacher. and But in, in personal study of God's word, of just walking through a passage, and instead of, you know, as the preacher, well, what do I need to say to my congregation? What do I need to hammer away at them? I feel like individuals can come at it to, what do I need? What's going to speak to my heart? Yeah, it becomes it's, centered around us, whether yeah. it's the preacher or the congregation. Especially for women. Right. I've seen so much that's emotionally driven as far as, oh, what really spoke to my heart today? I mean, I've even heard it talked about as far as how to read your Bible. Well, we'll just write down a verse that meant something to you today or that spoke to you today. Well, that's great. I guess, <laughs> but it's not really that great because is that really what that verse means? Are you plucking something out of context? Is that a promise that God really gave to you? Or is that something that you read in the Old Testament that's specific to Israel? And you have to be very careful about things like that. Um, and one book I think 
Um, I really enjoyed reading through this and this will kind of help in how you do personal Bible study for those that are not going to be studying for sermons is uh, my, one of my hermeneutics textbooks was 40 questions about interpreting the Bible. And it will help you to interpret different passages of scripture and talk about different things to think about, whether you're reading through poetry, because Hebrew poetry is written so differently from our English poetry and the styles of poetry we're familiar with. And you don't want to miss things and you don't want to even misunderstand or misinterpret scripture for yourself and your own personal devotions, because that can leave you very confused. Yeah, good point. Hermeneutics, when I took that class, I actually took it at West Coast. Uh, that is the class that changed me forever. And mm. I'll, I'll always say that because it's true. And some of the reading for that too, like, I don't know, I feel like hermeneutics reading for that class, even though I really, really enjoyed both of the books, um, it maybe it, it's not the most fun topic to read about. It can actually be boring, but it's actually super helpful, even though it, it may not be an exciting book. Well, you talked about it being a little bit boring. I never thought it was boring. I was like, give me more. I want to know a little bit more about this because I feel like I've always had this hunger and thirst for knowing how to study the Bible more than just reading it over and over and over and over and over again. That may depend on the hermeneutics book then. Um, when I when I read Exegetical Fallacies by D.A. Carson, I was on the edge of my seat that whole book. I mean, yeah. that was a book on hermeneutics that was not boring the littlest bit. Yeah, but I, I, I think but this... I've looked at some some boring ones. Yeah, well, forty <laughs> so questions about interpreting the Bible is very down to earth, very a very easy, smooth read. I mean, there's some funny parts in there too that I'll add in occasionally. So that that was an enjoyable read. I felt like we did have another textbook, which I would not recommend because it was very confusing, <laughs> but it was good. Ch- ah, see, <laughs> see, yeah. Well, we only had to read a couple chapters out of that one, but it challenged my mind to think and some big words in there. <laughs> So it was all good, but I wouldn't recommend that one for your average uh, reader that wants to know a little more about hermeneutics. But let's talk about now the benefits of text-driven preaching, or if you even want to think about text-driven Bible study, if you if, if you will. But text-driven preaching specifically highlights some, let's highlight some benefits of that. And you've just realized some of these recently, too, we've talked about. So one of the big benefits that impacts me every week of being text-driven, hopefully I strive to be at least, um, is I feel like that it relieves pressure. I felt like when I was coming up with the series that I'm preaching, I'm preaching this because I'm going to preach this series because I feel like I want to take the church here. I feel like the next move for the church is this, so I'm going to preach a series on this. Then I feel like I'm going to the next move for the church is here, so I'm going to preach a series on that or whatever. I felt like I was I was constantly I felt like the church was the clay and I was the potter. Mm. And that's not accurate. <laughs> I, I felt like that every sermon I needed to have ten people down at the altar making the decision. I felt like that I had to see visible results because I was preaching series for specific reasons. So I'm using the Bible to do it. So these sermons should produce results. And we need to go this direction as a church, so the results should be there. I want to see the results. Mm. And it I put feel a like tremendous there's... amount of pressure on myself, way too much. Yeah, I feel like that's a historical uh, perspective that was has been taught, yes, to a certain extent, and also modeled. Inherited, but that came yeah. from famous preachers in history, because you've talked to me about that. Can you expound upon that with Finney and Norris and Hiles and some of those. Oh, you named them, really. The main three um, that really did influence us was Charles Finney. He was the first to come up with the anxious bench, which then turned into altar calls. He was big on the here and now, the, the you know, don't, don't wait a second. If you understand this, then God is calling you. You make the decision right now. He was one of the first to start tracking numbers. This is how many we had accept Christ. This is mm-hmm. how. So that whole uh, build, build, build mentality comes from uh, Finney. Um, J. Frank Norris made a conscious decision to become a sensational preacher and to appeal to people to overly uh, hyper-emotionalize his Mm -hmm. sermons, Mm -hmm. very emotionally charged, and uh, dealt with a lot of shocking truths. And for a while, I felt that pressure also that if my sermon did not have a shocking truth, well, why are they going to come back then? 
if the sermon is not shocking, people aren't going to come back to church. And if it's not shocking, then I'm, the power of God's not on me. Mm. That's a good point. Because I remember when we first came to Fort Worth and the church that we were at, that was text-driven preaching. Oh, yeah. And it was such a culture shock to us because I remember I honestly, we left a few Sundays and we're like, okay, that was an okay sermon. I like, was almost disappointed on some <laughs> of them. I mean, looking back, the fault was with me. Yes, I was expecting yes. too much. We had to retrain our appetite and yes. we had to get a better appetite for the scriptures and just hearing the scriptures preached rather than some sensational thing that gets you all excited and fired up either that you're a really great Christian or you're a really horrible Christian or, you know whatever. And so, yeah, it, it, text driven is, is different to listen to even if you're used to something else. And, but it's a good thing to learn to create within yourself a good appetite for the scriptures. And that's, and this is a fallacy of the, the other, of this, uh, not being text driven is, is it puts too much pressure on the preacher and, uh, in, in a, an attempt to emotionally charge and, and really produce results, 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 results. We want to see results. This sermon has to produce results. Well, what if God does not want those results? This mm. this sermon, this yeah. time, this Sunday. Yeah. What if you want more than God does this Sunday? Mm. What if you want more people? What, what if he wants to use the church across town more than yours? Are you okay with that? Are you okay with just faithfully preaching the scriptures, loving the people in the church, and faithfully evangelizing? And, and are you trusting God for the fruit? Or are you trusting God for the fruit that meets your expectations? Mm. So and there's I, a difference. Who's really in charge? And this is what it comes down to, the sufficiency of Scripture. I was just about to say, is yeah. Is the Scripture enough? Yeah. Because if you're resting in the sufficiency of Scripture, you're allowing God to do the work in people's hearts. Just, this is what God said. How are you going to respond to it? Yeah. You know, this is what God said. And it, it, it brings it back to... The Lord is the one that's going to do the work. And it's so important to be reminded of that in ministry because, yeah, if the, if the pressure is all on you to see the results, that's not a healthy way to do. Yes. So that's a huge benefit of text-driven preaching. Yeah. David Allen says that the, a text-driven sermon is a sermon that gets all three of these things from the text. It gets the, the structure of the sermon. All right, so you're not cramming things into a three-point outline. You, 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 every sermon is not, let me give you three reasons why you should. You know, um, The structure comes from the text. If the text has one point, the sermon has one point. It, the substance comes from the text also, not just the main point, but the subpoints. The substance is the, the substance of the sermon is the substance of the text. And then what we're talking about now, the spirit of the text. We've talked about pathos in earlier po- context in earlier podcasts. That is the emotional content. That the same uh, spirit of the text is also the spirit of the sermon. So, you know, there's times where uh, I have felt pressure to emotionally charge a text that is not emotionally charged, <laughs> and 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 in those cases, I'm actually guilty of adding to the scriptures. Mm-hmm. And if you if you and listen here. If, if you get up to, anybody's listening to this, and you get up to preach a sermon, and you are accurately preaching the text, and yet you still feel it's lacking, you need to examine if you believe the scripture is really sufficient. If you are preaching the text, it is sufficient. You don't need to add anything to it. All right. So let me ask you, because this is something that I had thought about as we discussed text-driven preaching And I wondered about, just as a church member, um, one of the congregants, and you are my pastor, how do you, as the pastor, in order not to drive home, these are the points I want to drive home, how do you come to decide what passage? Do you just start in Genesis, preach all the way through the Bible, and then just start all over again, and just keep doing that for however long that may take? Or how do you decide what's the book I'm going to preach through? Well, that's a good question. How do I, well, and this is a big one too, because before I started preaching through books, that question was uh, the, the, a question of terror. 
every every ser- sermon series that ended, what am I doing next? And I felt this so much pressure. And I th- if any pastors out there listening to this, they probably know exactly what I'm talking about. I felt so much pressure that I had to come up with this extra biblical revelation from God, mm. showing like 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 Moses up on the mountain. This is where God told me we're going as a church. Well, hang on. God already gave us the content to preach. Mm -hmm. Preachers do not decide the content. God has given us the content. And as long as we are preaching the Bible and handling it right and and being text-driven preaching through the Bible, does it matter which book you're doing? Hmm. If you are faithfully preaching the Bible, God already gave us the ammo. We have, we have the, the ammunition, so to speak. We just need to be using it. And if you, are, if you are preaching through a book of the Bible or if you're preaching a series that can be text-driven, maybe we should, maybe we should talk about that next. Or, uh, let's talk about that now, actually. Uh, are there, can there be a series that's text-driven? Well, there's some definitely series-type mater- materials within the Bible if you think about the fruits of the Spirit. Yep. You can do a series on that, and you can dive into each one of those words or maybe a few of them, a few of the fruits every week. Well, and, um, and that's even text-driven because those are laid out line upon line mm-hmm. right in there. And as long as you keep those in the context of Ephesians, of why yeah. Paul wants them to know that, that's text-driven. You can still do a series and on, that's a great example of, of the fruits, Beatitudes. The fruits. Yeah, those are all line upon line as well. Ten the Commandments. Ten Commandments. Yep, mm-hmm. what else? Churches and Revelation. Great one. I'm sure there's others too, but <laughs> that's some that we, we just we just thought of. But uh... Yeah, you can still do a series and be text-driven. And, uh, I mean, ultimately, every pastor is responsible to God to how he, uh, you know, uh, preaches and uh, governs his church. Uh, I think there's definitely a lot of room for some autonomy in this uh, as far as what to preach. But as long as you're preaching the Bible, <laughs> that's what it comes down to. I know that's broad. It's very broad. Would you say, though, like preach through a book? Uh, I would say almost always. Okay. Personally, that, that kind of answers me. the question then for me. I mean, me I'm the... preaching through First Thessalonians, and I'm, then I'm going to do Old Testament book, New Testament book, Old Testament book, New Testament book, gotcha. personally. Um, now, is there a time where God will ever show me, hey, uh, there's some, you know, I don't know, like uh, it's time to do maybe a, a series on the church? Well, I would probably go through the seven churches in Revelation then. Or something, but I would try to still do it where I'm treating uh, the the it's naturally in the text. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Otherwise, I don't I don't want anything to be a patchwork of my thoughts of what this is what I think because once again you're running the risk of being overly systematic then and running the risk of almost having the attitude of you know I, I since I have the whole Bible I actually know more than this author. I've of actually it. heard pastors say that before that you know. They don't wouldn't care if they had the originals or whatever because now we have the whole Bible and therefore you know it's almost that's a license to use it however you want to. Yeah, yeah, and that's dangerous. And see, and that's where text driven keeps you anchored in the text. It gets you on God's calendar. It relieves the pressure, um, and it keeps you anchored in the text. So that uh, not to end on a negative note, but a few drawbacks of uh, not being text driven, or just some cautions, I guess, to be careful about and you talked about this but being overly topical that the pastor is going to decide the agenda um Certainly and there's an there's aspect of pastoring that. yes um not saying well the pastor doesn't need to pastor his flock but leaving a little more room for i would say for the holy spirit to work through the scriptures that god gave us the scriptures <laughs> absolutely that's a great way to put it and then, okay, so this is a funny one. <laughs> when Mother's Day rolled around and you're preaching through, you know, this book of the Bible, and I was like, well, I was almost a little offended. Like, well, aren't you going to preach on mothers on Mother's Day? Isn't that what you're supposed to do? <laughs> and so we had a whole little discussion about that of, well, just because something is on the calendar in America, where we are here, does not mean that that's what you're supposed to revolve your sermon around. 
and there's nothing wrong with that. That that may be a good occasion to handle a specific uh, topic like that. If certainly, if there's a pastor that you know feels led of the spirit to do that, he definitely has that right. You know, but there's been pers- lots of text-driven sermons on Proverbs 31. I can guarantee <laughs> that. <laughs> so thank you for staying in First Thessalonians. <laughs> but what I just didn't want to do is I didn't want I I just kind of came back around to what's driving the content is is a calendar outside of the scriptures driving a, a, the content mm. or is the scripture itself driving and this is where it comes down to it to me at least it all comes down to the sufficiency of scripture is what God gave us enough eventually we'll get to Proverbs 31 eventually we'll get to Hannah right mm. uh, we'll, yeah. we'll get to all of oh, those yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was we'll like, why don't you just preach on Hannah? That's from a text. As they come up in the scripture. <laughs> but uh, I don't need to, I personally don't, I don't feel like I need to at least uh, jump around from here to there or anything like that. And that's what I was saying is being text driven, it slows you down and it gets you on mm-hmm. God's calendar. Yeah. And I think that there's a lot of preachers that have too, put too much pressure on themselves. Well, I feel like if it's all about you and what text you could pull out, there's a little bit too much emphasis on, and this is what I was talking about with having to change our appetites because we were used to, whoa, this person has a really good outline. Whoa, they have great alliteration. You know, yeah. every point starts with the same letter or, oh, wow, how they use current events to shape the sermon oh, around it, you know, big, that yeah. sort of thing, rather than leaving and meditating on the scripture, which is what we learned how to do when we were in Fort Worth, I feel like, and just giving yourself, uh, cultivating in yourself a good appetite for the scriptures and to be used to hearing that kind of preaching and to long for that kind of preaching. And that's a healthy place to be. And certainly there's a time to address something that is uh, prevalent in the culture. But it should come out of the text. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It, I mean, it and happened for you this last Sunday. If there's one, if there's one issue, then another issue. Because the culture always has issues. Mm-hmm. And if all we do is speak to issues, the question is this. What's driving the agenda in the pulpit then? Is it God or is it the world? Well, that's a good point. And is also it, you're going to miss a lot of scripture too. Yes. Is the scripture sufficient? What you're essentially saying is the way God gave it to us, if, if you're driven only by reaction in your, in your sermon content and sermon series or whatever, then essentially what you're saying is how God gave it to us isn't good enough. We have to revolve our preaching around what's going on in the world today. And that's actually, I think that's dangerous. Yeah. Well, we always like to end with some resources. I've already named mine, but just to mention them one more time, uh, the book by Jen Wilkin, Women of the Word. Great book. I think there's a couple, I've sent it to a friend and um, there's a couple other people that told me that they had bought it um, when I did a shout out to that one over the summer or the, the spring, excuse me, in January. And then also 40 questions about interpreting the Bible um, by Robert Plummer, and then I think you have two resources. Also, you mentioned a lecture, and yeah, there's one lecture. I'll link it. I, I found it on YouTube, and uh, David Allen teaches this to I think it's a state convention in Arkansas or a bunch of some some meeting in Arkansas. But it, basically, it, it's a crash course on text driven preaching, and so that is uh, will be linked there. And then uh, the book uh, for, edited by Danny Aiken, David Allen and Ned Matthews on text-driven preaching. I've actually sent this book to two different people in the last two weeks, <laughs> just mm-hmm. just people that I went to school with at West Coast, good guys out there still in full-time ministry, just loving the Lord. So this book is a constant guide for me. I personally use it, and uh, text-driven preaching has really, really, I'm so glad. that, that To me, that was worth seminary alone mm-hmm. right there. It, it was. Well, thank you for joining us for today's Combo.